happy Wednesday! You're listening to Mama Murdered a Podcast. I'm your host, A.B. This week on Mama Murdered a Podcast, we'll be covering part four of Chris Watts. And I am sure that I'm not the only one that is tired of hearing about this man, but we're almost to the finish line, y'all bear with me. Just a quick reminder before I say let's get it, you will want to go back and listen to part one, two, three, and then listen to part four, or you're going to be extremely confused, and I say that every week. But, since we are all here for one thing and one thing only, let's get it. We've covered a lot in parts one, two, and three, so I'm just going to sum it up in a sentence. In the first three parts, we go through how Chris and Shanann met, how the couple ended up in Colorado from North Carolina. We go through how Chris and his mistress met, how Chris and Shanann's marriage started falling apart almost immediately after he started his affair. And in the last episode of part three, we went over the girls and Shanann being reported missing. So let's jump into part four. All right, we ended last week on the police doing another search of the Watts home and Chris giving his infamous, horrible porch interview. So it wasn't long after the investigators found a literal whole ass bed sheet in the kitchen trash can that none other than Chris Watts' fancy new mistress, Nicole Kessinger, walked into the police station and she tells the police every single thing about the affair that was going on between she and Chris. She tells them everything. Why? Because she a runner, she a track star. She gonna run away when it gets hard. Okay, I'm done, I swear. But she does tell them the truth as far as everything that Chris had told her. So, not a lot of the truth because Chris lies literally every time he opens his mouth. Chris had actually been texting Kessinger all day long on August 13th. Yep, that would be the same day that his wife and both of his kids were reported missing. So, all of the body cam footage that's available to watch from the police walking through the Watts' house that day and interviewing Chris, you know, outside, inside, and around his house, when you see a very unconvincing worried Chris texting on his phone... We all probably collectively assume that this was Chris worried about his entire family and texting other family members and friends for updates of Shanann, information that they may have, but that's not at all what he was doing. He was texting Kessinger. And according to what Kessinger told police, Chris and Shanann had decided to separate and divorce and that it was a mutual decision and that the couple had already decided on 50-50 custody of the kids They were going to sell their house and go their separate ways. So, if we're to believe what Kessinger says, it sounds like Chris and Shanann had this whole separation already worked out. And Kessinger herself had actually gone so far as to help Chris look for a two-bedroom apartment for him to move into when him and Shanann were able to sell their house. So, all of this sounds pretty amicable so far. Except for the fact that Shanann had no idea that Chris even wanted a divorce, which seems like a problem. I'm really sorry. I think there's a train coming. This train comes every single week when I record, and I'm just tired of fighting with it. I'm sorry. I hope it's not too distracting. (laughs) But also, let's think about this for a second. Chris would soon have three kids, and that's not including himself and his mistress. He's looking at two-bedroom apartments for five people to live in. Okay, because that makes sense. But we can all keep pretending that this wasn't extremely premeditated and we'll keep going. Kessinger then says that she and Chris haven't talked about her meeting his kids yet or marriage or anything of the sort. But then in that same breath, she also says that they only talked about marriage offhandedly. So it seems like she also lies every time she opens her mouth, which would explain why her and Chris hit it off so quick. And right after Kessinger tells the police that are interviewing her, that she and Chris hadn't talked about her meeting his kids yet. She then says that they also had never talked about, quote-unquote, cutting the mom out. The mom being Shanann, and how weird of a comment is that? Kessinger tells police that she didn't know that Shanann was pregnant, and we've already determined that that was a lie. She had been Googling both of their names for six months or longer before she and Chris supposedly ever started their affair. And the lies go on and on like this during the interview that Kessinger gave with investigators. Kessinger goes on to tell investigators that Chris told her that he and Shanann were always broke because Shanann spent too much money and that she didn't respect Chris. And Kessinger even tells the detectives that 
Chris's kids had started picking up on the way that Shanann talked to Chris, and they were starting to repeat the disrespectful things that Shanann would say. So it seems to me like Kessinger knows a lot more about their marriage than she wants anybody to believe. Kessinger did admit to the police that were interviewing her that she had deleted everything off her phone that was in any way, shape, or form related to Chris. She claims that when she saw Chris on the news pleading for his wife and kids' safe return, that she realized that he had been lying about him and Shanann being separated the whole time. Kessinger says that she was hurt by this news that Chris had been lying to her for their entire relationship. She claimed that she hadn't deleted anything off of her phone to try to hide anything. Of course not. (laughs) That she thought of deleting everything off of her phone as kind of the equivalent of a bad breakup. That she wouldn't have thought anything more about deleting all the stuff off her phone if she hadn't have seen that Shanann and the kids were missing. And I feel like Dr. Phil says it best when he says, if they'll do it with you, they'll do it to you. So maybe Dr. Phil should have given Kessinger some life advice before she jumped into bed with a married man. It wasn't long after finding this bed sheet in the trash can that Chris would go in for his first interview. This is also when the dreaded polygraph test would be administered to Chris. Chris walked into the police station and interrogation room with no wedding ring on his finger. I feel like if your spouse is missing, regardless of how healthy your relationship was or not, you'd probably be wearing your wedding ring. Chris runs through this timeline of events that happened on the night of the 12th and the morning of the 13th. And he's being interviewed by FBI agent Graham Coder of the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. He's also being interviewed by the baddest bitch, Tammy Lee, and she's also an investigations field agent with the CBO or Colorado Bureau of Investigation. So Chris tells agents Tammy Lee and Graham Coder during this interview that Shanann was supposed to be home earlier than what she actually got home from the airport, that her flight was delayed, but when Shanann did get home, she laid down beside Chris. She started rubbing on him and snuggling with him, and it kind of wakes Chris up, and the two have sex. Chris says that after the two had sex, but before they went to sleep, that Shanann had asked if he would wake her up before he left for work in the morning. Chris claims that Shanann had asked him to wake her up so that she could shower and, quote, get the airport off of her, whatever that's supposed to mean. Chris left for work most mornings around 5 a.m. Shanann didn't get home until almost 2 in the morning, and she's pregnant. What woman in her right mind would ask to be woken up with little to no sleep while they're pregnant? But regardless, this is the story that Chris ran with in the beginning, so that's what we'll go with for now. So what else does Chris say happened on the morning that his entire family seemed to vanish into thin air? Well, I'll tell you. Chris says that he wakes up and gets himself ready for work, that after he gets dressed and ready for work, that's when he wakes Shanann up. After he woke Shanann up, the two talked about selling their house and getting a separation. This was the quote-unquote emotional conversation that he was referring to in his infamous porch interview. He says that the conversation was emotional and that they were both upset and crying, but that Shanann told him that she was going to take the kids to a friend's house, but that she would be back later on that day. Only problem with that is that Shanann and the kids had never left the house that morning alive, and Chris knew it while he was sitting in the interrogation room, lying through his teeth and lying directly into the investigator's face. But we'll keep going. Chris tells investigators that by about 7.30 that morning that he had texted Shanann and asked which friend that she had taken the kids to visit, but that she never responded. Chris says that not getting a response didn't really worry him because Shanann sometimes wouldn't return his calls or texts. A lot of the time she didn't return his calls or texts if she was busy with her direct sales team. And it wasn't until about 12 that afternoon that Chris realized that he still hadn't spoken to Shanann all day. So he decided he would call Shanann, but again, she did not answer. So since Shanann hadn't answered his calls, he figured he would text her again, and he just said something like, hey, give me a call. And it was at 12.10 p.m. that Chris's phone ding to let him know that somebody was at his front door. The front door notification was from Nicole Atkinson standing outside of Chris and Shanann's house. Nicole was there and she was looking for Shanann. According to Chris, this is when he called Nicole to see what was going on. And Nicole told Chris that she hadn't been able to get in touch with Shanann all day either. Nicole also tells Chris that she had already checked with Shanann's OBGYN and that whoever she talked to had told Nicole that Shanann had never made it to this appointment to check on baby Nico. 
But also, isn't this illegal as hell for any kind of doctor's office to give somebody's information out like that? Like, unless Nicole was set as one of Shanann's emergency contacts and was given permission to have her personal information, uh, you know, regarding her appointments, records, labs, things like that, I don't know. I have always wondered how Nicole was able to know that Shanann missed her appointment. Maybe it's just me because I only have one friend that I would trust to do that and one friend in general, so maybe that's the difference between me and Shanann. And Chris says that it wasn't until after Nicole told him that Shanann's car was still in the garage and that she could still see Shanann's shoes were still sitting by the front door that that's when he started to think that something was weird. So he told Nicole that he was leaving work and that he was on his way home and he would meet her there. Nicole let Chris know that she had already alerted police to the fact that she thought something was very much wrong and that the police would probably already be there by the time that Chris got home. And from here in the interrogation, Chris just kind of relays all the things that we've already gone over. Finding Shanann's phone, calling any of Shanann's friends, checking neighbors and viewing home security cameras, yada yada yada. After this, Chris goes into a super long and weird list of things that he misses doing with his wife and kids, like how he misses tucking his girls in for bed at night, and how he misses the girls throwing chicken nuggets at him. Which I'm like, why are your kids throwing food in the house? But that's none of my business though. Then he says that wherever his family is, that he just hopes that they're okay and that they're safe. Okay, Chris. Okay. Investigators start asking the tougher kinds of questions, like if he thought that Shanann could be having an affair. And Chris says that he doesn't really know, but that it's possible. Then they ask if Chris is having an affair, and he tells them absolutely not. He's just not that kind of guy. Okay, sure you're not. And I'm not a chubby white mom from the South. But we'll keep going. Okay, but this also brings me to one of the best parts in this interview, and that is the part where Chris tells the investigators with a really straight face that he honestly believes that if he or Shanann either one were even thinking about having an affair, that he thinks they would just sit down and talk about it before it actually happened. Huh? Where'd I do that? Oh, so investigators finally ask if he and Shanann were in a good enough place to talk about an affair before it happened, Then why were they talking about separating? Chris says that the five weeks that Shanann and the girls were in North Carolina, that things just didn't feel right between the two, but that they had grown more distant over the last year or so of their relationship. And then Chris continues on with what happened that morning before he left work again. Chris says that he told Shanann that he wanted to separate and that she accused him of having an affair. Now, this is the second timeline of events that we're getting from Chris in the same interview. Just keep that in mind. So after Shanann accuses Chris of having an affair, Chris says that he told Shanann, and I'm going to quote him here, quote, this isn't like somebody came into my life and took me from you. There's no outside influence coming from this, which is weird because that's actually exactly what had happened. So then he tells the investigators that he packed his book bag, water bottle, etc. into his work truck and he left for work that he had to go to Survey 319, which is an oil field that had a leak that he was supposed to be fixing that Monday morning. This is also the same oil field that Chris called his boss the night before to let him know that he would be there and that he didn't need help, he could fix it by himself. So premeditation or coincidence? I'll let you decide. Survey 319 is one of the many oil fields that Chris maintained and worked at through the company that he worked for. Chris got to survey 319 at around 6.45 a.m., and he was there by himself for about an hour. A few of Chris's co-workers showed up about an hour after he had gotten there. Chris and his co-workers were at survey 319, and Chris left survey 319 at approximately 8 a.m. From survey 319, Chris rode around to different oil fields and went on about his regular shift at work. Investigators ask Chris if Bella and Cece had ever been to any of the oil fields that Chris had worked for, and Chris said that they hadn't because it was company policy that nobody outside of Chris could be inside of his work truck. A lot of companies have this rule for employees that take work trucks home. It's kind of an insurance thing. But this little statement would kind of come back to bite Chris later on in this investigation. Chris had already told investigators that no one was allowed inside his work truck and that they had never been inside of his work truck. Hence, none of their DNA should be anywhere inside of his work truck. Chris goes on and on and on in this interview for hours and hours, telling investigators that he just wants to know that his wife and daughters are safe. 
and that he has no idea where they are or what happened to them, and I really don't think that these people are buying anything that Chris is selling. And Chris has to be literally the dumbest human alive, because when Colorado Bureau of Investigations field agent Tammy Lee and FBI Special Agent Graham Coder asked Chris if he'd be willing to come in the next morning and take a polygraph, Chris just agrees to take it even though he had to have known full well that he was going to fail it miserably. But just like he said he would, when the next morning rolled around, Chris showed up and he was ready for the polygraph test. Agent Tammy Lee explains exactly how this polygraph test would work. She tells Chris that even though he's nervous, that his nervousness would not cause him to fail this polygraph. She explains to him that the only thing that would cause him to fail is if there was something that he was lying about. She takes a good hour or two to explain the kind of rules to taking a polygraph test, and she makes sure that he completely understands the wording of each question that he'll be asked. And before they start the polygraph test, she just flat out tells Chris that if he had anything to do with his pregnant wife and his two daughters disappearing, that it would be really stupid of him to come in and agree to take this polygraph test. And Chris agrees with her like he doesn't know he's about to be caught. And it was on August 15th, 2018, after multiple hours of being interviewed, Chris was finally given the polygraph test that he knew he wasn't going to pass. And I think at this point, the investigators that are questioning and interviewing Chris also knew that he wasn't going to pass this test. But the show must go on, and so it did. Agent Tammy Lee had been the one questioning Chris the entire time, and she was also going to be the one to give Chris his polygraph. Chris was first asked a series of questions to be able to tell when he was lying. So, for this set of questions, Chris was supposed to lie intentionally. So, Agent Tammy Lee asked Chris to write down a number between 1 and 10. And then they asked him if he wrote each number between 1 and 10. Did you write number 1? No. Did you write number 2? No. So on and so forth. Now, Tammy Lee did know which number that Chris had written down. And after being asked these questions, she (laughs) even goes so far as to show Chris his results and ask him if anyone's ever told him that he's a really bad liar. Tammy shows Chris that when she asked about the number three, that he was so clearly lying that he started going off the charts of the page with the polygraph, declaring that he was lying. He had actually written down the number three. She then tells him that this is a good thing because if he didn't have anything to do with his wife and daughters being missing, that this would be a really good way for them to clear his name so that they could move on to other suspects and work through the case. This also could have helped put Chris at ease that it would detect that he was telling the truth versus when he was lying, which would be great if he wasn't actually guilty, but he is. And after more than three hours of doing these baseline questions and explaining his results to the number on the paper game and prepping him for the actual polygraph test that he was about to take, Agent Tammy Lee says something to Chris that I think should go down in history books. Agent Tammy tells Chris, quote, Right now, there's only one person in this room that knows the truth. And in about five minutes, there's going to be two of us. So that's the coolest part, okay? And then the polygraph test is set to start, and Chris was then asked another series of questions. Some of the easier questions that he should have been able to answer truthfully were questions like, is your name Christopher Lee Watts? And is your birthday May 16th, 1985? These questions were used as a baseline to know when Chris was being truthful to make it easier to detect when he was also being deceptive. Chris was also asked questions like, did you physically cause Shanann's disappearance? Of course, Chris answered no. Chris was asked a few more questions like, do you know where Shanann is now? And again, Chris answered no. And on these kinds of questions, Chris's lies were literally going off the charts. And with a few more questions, the test was over and the results were in. The lie detector test determined that Chris lies about literally everything. And Agent Tammy calls this out with no hesitation after the test is completed. A score of negative four would be considered a lie, and Chris scored a negative 18. (laughs) So, Agent Tammy Lee walks back into the interrogation room and says, quote, So, it's completely clear that you were not honest during their testing. And Chris doesn't let up on his lies that easily, well, not just yet anyways. He claims that he wasn't lying, and he basically tries to pinky promise that he was being honest. And this is when Agent Graham and Agent Tammy start playing everybody's favorite game. Good cop, bad cop. 
Agent Graham tells Chris that everyone they've talked to has said that Chris is such a great guy, and that part's true. This wasn't one of those cases where, after the murders, people were saying things like, yep, we could have saw that coming. It was actually the complete opposite of that. No one said that they could have saw this coming, or could have ever predicted that this would have happened. And I guess Chris figured that if he told them one true thing, that they would think that was the whole reason that he failed his polygraph test. So he gives it a try. And Chris tells Agent Tammy Lee and Agent Graham Coder that he was actually cheating on his wife, Shanann. And I don't know if Chris honestly thought that these investigators didn't already know about the affair that he had been having with Kessinger. They are trained agents with an abundance of knowledge and investigative skills and so many other tools at their disposal. They use these tools to dig into the dirtiest closets of people that they're investigating. Yes, Chris, they already knew about your mistress. So when Chris tells Agent Tammy Lee and Agent Graham Coder that he's having an affair with his wife, Agent Coder literally just looks at Chris and says, we know, which I kind of felt was like a mic drop moment. (laughs) But it also may be important to go ahead and mention here that the polygraph test didn't ask one single question about Chris having an affair or anything related to if he was a faithful husband or not. What does that have to do with him failing a polygraph? Absolutely nothing. Agent Tammy basically tells Chris that she couldn't care less about him lying to them about his mistress. She explained that their main concern at this point is to find his missing pregnant wife and their two daughters. That they believe that he knows exactly where they are and what happened to them. And I honestly think that Chris thought that if he would just come clean about the mistress thing, that they would just assume that that's what he had been lying about the whole time and just kind of let him go home. And then Agent Tammy points out something that I hadn't even noticed up until this point, and something that I don't think I would have even paid attention if I hadn't watched all of the interviews and if she hadn't ever brought it up. Chris tells investigators that he and Shannon had had this long, emotional conversation on the morning that she and the girls were last seen, and that he and Shannon were crying together and holding each other, and they were both just sick with emotion. But he has been inside this interrogation room for two straight days now, and he has not so much as shed one single tear, thinking that something bad could have happened to his wife or his kids. He hadn't cried one single time throughout their entire two days worth of interviews with him. Make that make sense. And it's right about this time when Agent Tammy does one of the baddest of baddest moves, and she has to kind of plant this idea into Chris's head. Okay, so Agent Tammy kind of hints around to the idea that maybe Shanann did something to Bella and Cece, and that maybe Chris just had to kind of clean up Shanann's mess. Like, maybe Chris didn't want to kill Shanann, but that he had to quote-unquote defend his kids from his wife. But at first, Chris denies that Shanann would ever hurt the girls, and he denies that he hurt Shanann. Chris tells investigators that Shanann, Bella, and Cece were all in the house that morning when he left for work, and that they were all okay. Investigators tell him that he has to be lying because they have combed through all of the surveillance footage in that neighborhood. No one left their house after he drove off in his work truck that morning. Chris says that he doesn't know because, you know, they were all there when he left, and we'll find out later, that's also a lie. But moving on. Chris must not have realized that the agent sitting in the same room with him had already been going through Shanann's phone and they had already read all the text messages between Shanann and all of her closest friends where Shanann told them all how distant Chris had been lately. Investigators had already been through Chris's phone too and they had also saw any trace of Kessinger that was left on his phone. They had already talked to the neighbors and everybody agreed that Chris wasn't acting in a way that was normal for him. And they already felt like Chris knew a hell of a lot more than he was letting on about where his wife and kids were. Now they just had to figure out a way to get him to tell them the truth. And they try a few different tactics. The first of which is when Agent Graham Coder decides to show Chris a picture of Shanann, Bella, and Cece. Chris didn't cry. Chris didn't get pissed. And Chris didn't show any emotion at all whatsoever. Instead of getting emotional, he just talked about the shoes that Cece was wearing in this picture how much she had always loved those shoes. And he talks about Bella and the dress that she's wearing in the picture and how much he knew that Bella had always loved that dress. The way that Chris was talking about his kids was like he knew that they were both gone and that they weren't going to be coming back. And investigators picked up on this too. Chris seemed extremely uninterested in how this investigation was coming along day after day. 
After the very first date, Chris had never, not even once, asked to go out and search for his family. After the first day that he asked, and the first responding officer told him that he needed to stay put, he just never offered up to go look for them again at all. Chris never offered up tips or explanations on where, how, or why his entire family was missing. But little did Chris know that at this exact same time that he was sitting inside the police station failing his polygraph, showing no emotion, that detectives and investigators were also searching via bird's eye view of all the job sites with the Anadarko company that Chris worked for. This bird's eye view also included Site Survey 319, which, if you'll remember, was the first place that Chris stopped the morning on August 13th when his family was reported missing. And what detectives and investigators found doing this aerial view search of Survey 319 was chilling at best. It was painfully obvious that something was arrived because while they have drones flying overhead, they clearly spot a white sheet laying on the ground below them, not far from the massive oil drums on that oil field. And again, let's remember that when first responding officers showed up to do a walkthrough of the Watts family home, with Chris's permission, there were absolutely no sheets on the master bed, and they would later find one of the sheets to the sets that was missing in the kitchen garbage can. And now there was miraculously another matching sheet laying on the ground at one of Chris's job sites. Not a good look, Chris. Not a good look. But in order to be sure that this was the same sheet, they needed to match the pattern and the material to the sheet that was found inside the trash can at the Watts family home. But before they even had time to do that, while still flying drones bird's eye over the oil fields, they also noticed disturbed earth beneath them, and it was kind of in the shape of what most would consider a human grave-sized site of disturbed earth. And while detectives and investigators are finding all of this at Survey 319, agents Tammy Lee and Graham Coder are back at the police station with Chris Steele. And they're trying to use any tactic that they've ever learned throughout their entire careers in order to finally get the truth out of Chris. And this is when Tammy offered up the idea that maybe Shanann had done something to the girls and Chris felt like he needed to retaliate against her. And I've always wondered why the hell she would do this and make Shanann look like the villain when she's so obviously the victim. And later, Tammy Lee says during an A&E special about this case that this is a tactic that some cases need in order to just start getting their suspects' confessions of what actually happened pointed in the right direction of the truth and that none of the investigators ever actually thought that Shanann would hurt either one of her kids. So Chris goes on for a few minutes. He's still trying to deny everything. And one of the agents tells Chris to just tell him where Shanann and the kids are. And you can just see his entire body language change. Chris finally looks defeated, and he just asks agents if he can speak to his dad. Chris's dad, Ronnie, had flown halfway across the country to be there for his son, and the investigators had to make a split-second decision that would normally involve supervisors signing off on. They had to decide if it would be in their best interest to let Chris talk with Ronnie in private, with the camera still rolling, of course or whether it would be in their best interest to deny Ronnie coming in with Chris alone, with the camera still rolling. But with what they had already pieced together, and what they thought they knew already, they didn't have time to waste, and they knew it. So they decided that they were going to let Chris and Ronnie talk in private. They hoped that Chris was finally ready to tell the truth about what happened on August 13th, and hopefully he would be willing to tell the truth to his dad. Agent Tammy Lee and Agent Graham Coder made that split-second decision, and they did let Ronnie come into the interrogation room with Chris. They made sure to let Chris know that everything that would be said between himself and his dad would still be recorded and used as audio and video evidence, and that she and Agent Graham Coder both would be standing right outside the door. But can we all take a minute and realize how quickly this move could have went real wrong real fast? because all it would have taken is for Ronnie to come into that room with Chris and advise him to stop answering any questions and to get an attorney. And that would have stopped the line of questioning and the interrogation in its tracks. It would have been completely done for at that point. Because at this time in the investigation, Chris still wasn't under arrest. He could have gotten up, refused to answer any more questions, and he could have left without needing a reason. Thankfully, that's not what happened, though. But it's here, at this exact moment, Every single time I go through this case in my head, that I wonder about the way that Chris must have felt when he asked for his dad. And the only thing that I can think of is the fact that Chris is a grown-ass man, 
And still, in his time of desperation and being afraid for what his future might hold, after he tells his dad some version of the truth and how scared Chris must have felt to even ask for his dad, and it always makes me wonder, how badly do you think that Bell and Cece wanted their daddy to protect them in their time of fear, in their time of watching the unknown happen right in front of them? It literally nauseates me every time I think about it. So Chris's dad, Ronnie, comes into the room after both of the agents that had been questioning Chris walked out of the room. So now it's just Chris and his dad alone. And it makes this moment just a little bit sadder because Chris's dad had just so happened to be wearing a sweatshirt that was like monogrammed or embroidered or something. And the top corner of the sweatshirt, it said something like Papa Ronnie or Grandpa Ronnie or something super heartbreaking along those same lines. And when Ronnie comes into the room and sits down with his son, Chris tells him that he failed his polygraph test. And Ronnie's like, well, maybe you're just feeling too many emotions to be able to pass it. But Chris knew that his emotions weren't the reason that he failed, so he goes on and tells his dad that they knew about the affair and that they weren't going to let him leave. Ronnie asks Chris if there's a reason that Chris wants to tell him about for maybe why they wouldn't let him leave. And it's at this point that just above a whisper, Chris says, quote, I don't want to protect her, but I don't know what else to do. He goes on to tell his dad how Shanann hurt the girls, and then he flipped out on Shanann. This is the exact same story that Agent Tammy Lee had just planted in Chris's head mere minutes before his dad entered the room. Coincidence? Or... Hmm. Chris tells his dad that Belle and Cece aren't coming back and that Shanann hurt them. And his first confession story was that Shanann strangled the girls. Then in the very next sentence, he says that Shanann smothered the girls and that he choked Shanann on Cece's bed. But also, smothered and strangled are very different things, and I don't think that Chris knows that because he's an idiot. After hearing the first confession, Agent Tammy Lee and Agent Graham Coder join Chris and Ronnie in the interrogation room. And the agents just kind of ask Chris where they could find his missing family members. And at first, Chris tells them that they're gone and there's no bringing them back and that they're all gone for good, basically. Agent Tammy Lee asks Chris if he can tell him where his family is. And she asks him a few times before Chris finally puts his hands in his face and looks towards the ground and tells both the agents and his own dad that his wife, who's 15 weeks pregnant, and his three- and four-year-old daughter or at the first location that he went to on August 13th. That location would be Survey 319. Ronnie asks Chris if they were all buried out there, and Chris only answers with, quote, Shanann is. From here, it's just going to keep getting rougher and more emotional, and I've had to stop. I can't even tell you how many times doing this research, and it's taken me three days to record this episode, and I'm only 35 minutes in, so... <laughs> oh... Chris tells both of the agents and his dad that they can all three be found at the oil field on Survey 319. Agent Tammy Lee asks Chris if he would be willing to take them there and show them where Shanann, Bella, and Cece were. Because Chris had already made it pretty clear that this area where they were was extremely vast and open fields, and they needed to know exactly where they were in order to be able to find them. Chris tells Agent Tammy Lee that he can't go back to that site. Even though he seemed just fine going back to that site while he was disposing of his wife and kids' body there like they were old trash. But that's besides the point. He says he just can't manage to go out there and help them recover their bodies because of course he can't. So instead, the agents bring in an aerial view picture that the drone had taken of Survey 319. And they ask Chris if he can point out exactly where Shanann, Bell, and Cece are on this image. Chris marks a shallow grave that they had seen with the newly disturbed earth with an S. An S for Shanann. When Agent Tammy Lee asked where Bella and Cece were, he marked the left oil tank with a B and the right oil tank with a C. B for Bella, C for Celeste. And these oil tanks are massive. They almost look like silos or something. So that just means that Chris had to carry each of his dead daughters up two-ish or so flights of stairs and then open a tiny eight-inch hatch at the very top of the oil tank and force his kids' body inside of it. And he also had to do this one by one because there were two oil tanks and one kid was in each tank. Chris also tells investigators that it only took him about 20 or 30 minutes to dig Shanann's grave, 
well, because he's a big, strong man, I have no idea why he felt the need to throw that in here. Later, Chris even goes into so much detail as to say that he could tell that the levels on each oil tank were different by the way the body splashed when they dropped. I can't believe I just said that out loud. And probably in the state of awe that Agent Graham and Agent Lee were in, Agent Graham asked Chris if Bella and Cece were actually inside of the oil tanks. And Chris tells him that they are. Agent Lee asks what else is in those huge tanks, and Chris tells her that it's a mixture of water and oil. Chris had placed his own three- and four-year-old daughters inside of these huge drums containing oil and water. He had left them there after he murdered them with his own two hands. If that doesn't make your stomach turn with sadness, grief, and disbelief, I don't know what will. This case has stuck with me for so long, and I think it's the fact that parents are supposed to love and protect their children. Parents are supposed to be there for their kids while they help fight off the evil that surrounds them in this world. They aren't supposed to be the evil that they need protecting from. And that's what Chris was. He was the evil that these babies needed protecting from. Investigators kind of have to remind Chris that now Shanann's dead and that if she didn't have anything to do with what happened to Bill and Cece, then it's not fair to make people believe that she did, especially since she's no longer here and able to defend herself. Chris insists that he's telling the truth and that he's done lying, and that last sentence was also a lie. When Agent Tammy Lee asked Chris, quote, Are you okay with the public knowing that Shanann killed her daughters? Chris replies with, quote, I didn't hurt these girls. These girls? They're his kids. These aren't just some random stranger's kids that he's talking about. He's talking about his own kids and calling them, quote, these kids or those girls. Agent Tammy Lee asked Chris over and over and over again if he's okay with the public knowing that Shanann's the one that killed her own daughters. And Chris seems fine with letting people believe this. But Agent Tammy Lee knew that Chris was still lying because every time he opens his mouth, he is lying. She had been talking to Chris for hours and hours and hours, and she had figured that much out. So Chris's first confession went something along the lines of he heard something from downstairs after he had gotten ready for work, and that he was walking back upstairs to finish talking to Shanann. I'm guessing this was in the midst of their quote-unquote emotional conversation. But as Chris was walking back upstairs to finish talking to Shanann, that he saw on a baby monitor thing that they had, and it seemed like Bella was laying lifeless in her bedroom floor. And after he saw Bella, the monitor switched to another screen, and that's when Chris saw Shanann sitting on top of Cece with Shanann's hands wrapped around Cece's neck. This was only the first confession. There were many, many confessions. After getting the locations of the bodies, agents came in to take pictures of Chris's chest, arms, hands, and back to look for defensive wounds. And almost immediately after they had gotten the pictures that they needed, an officer came in and asked Chris to stand up, place his hands against a wall, and they told him that he was under arrest for the murder of Shanann, Bella, and Cece Watts. Chris was officially fired from Anadarko Petroleum on August 15th, which just so happened to be the same day that he was arrested. Agents are gathering every tiny bit of information that they can find, and as quick as Chris has given them anything that they can use, the agents and interrogators are kind of playing telephone with the detectives and police officers that are back at Survey 319 at the oil field. Chris was extremely worried about what people that he worked with were going to think about him when they found out what happened. Chris is also still going along with the lie that Shanann killed Bella and Cece, and that he retaliated on Shanann in a fit of rage and also killed her. But police and detectives were eventually able to recover Shanann, Bella, and Cece's bodies from the shallow grave and the oil drums. And it was later determined that the widest opening of the oil drum was about 8 inches in diameter, but that the widest part of Bella and Cece's bodies, which would be their shoulders and thigh areas, were about 10 inches. So the opening that he shoved them in was actually smaller than the widest part of their bodies. This means that Chris had to have forcibly made Bell and Cece's bodies go into the 8-inch opening. During the autopsy on the bodies and later at trial, it was determined that Bella had fought like hell. She had bitten her tongue multiple times in the struggle for her life against the one man that was supposed to protect her. Chris later finally admitted to what he claims actually happened, and that was that Chris and Shanann had sex after she returned home from her trip to Arizona, and that after they had sex, Shanann could feel that things were different, and she confronted Chris about it. 
Chris says that he told Shanann about Nicole Kessinger and that he wanted a divorce. And of course, Shanann was pissed. And she was basically screaming that if they split up, that Chris would never see the girls again. This is when he says that he just kind of went into a fit of rage and killed Shanann. Chris rolled Shanann's body up in the fitted sheet that was later found with the body at the shallow grave that he had dug. He then loaded Cece and Bella up into his work truck and that Cece and Bella were both scared and that when they got to Survey 319 and both girls kept asking what he was doing with mommy. Chris doesn't remember what he told him though. Chris then says that he murdered Cece first and that he put her blanket over her face and then held his hand over her face. And Bella had to watch as he killed her three-year-old sister. After Cece had been suffocated to death, Bella watched as Chris carried Cece's body up to the top of the oil tank and put her inside before he came back down the flight of stairs to where Bella was sitting in the back seat of his truck. That's when Bella asked Chris if he was going to do the same thing to her. Chris says that he doesn't remember if he even said anything to her before he actually did do the same thing to her. And something else that we later find out is that between the small window of time when Chris was murdering his wife and kids and the time that he was being questioned by police and eventually arrested, that he was Googling more song lyrics. Like I mentioned in the earlier episode, this is something that Chris did often depending on his mood. But just a short time after murdering his entire family and being caught in a massive pile of lies, Chris Googled the lyrics to the song Battery by his most favorite band, Metallica. Some of the song lyrics in no particular order are, quote, crushing all deceivers, mashing non-believers. Some more lyrics are, smashing through the boundaries, lunacy has found me, cannot stop the battery, pounding on aggression, turns into obsession, cannot kill the battery, cannot kill the family, battery is found in me, battery, battery. So this song seems to make perfect sense with what's going on in Chris's life at this exact moment that he was Googling the song. After the bodies were discovered and after Chris was arrested, he pled guilty on all charges, and he agreed to the plea deal in order to take the death penalty off of the table. The charges included nine felonies, and the charges were as follows, three counts of first-degree murder, two counts of first-degree murder of a person under the age of 12, while being in the position of trust, which I didn't even realize was an actual charge, but I'm glad it is. Chris was also charged with one count of unlawful termination of pregnancy and three counts of tampering with a body of a deceased persons or person. As a result, all the charges that Chris pled guilty to, he was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences with an additional two more life sentences tacked on to those first three. I guess they did this for good measure. Chris also got sentenced to an additional 84 years So, Chris will never see the light of day again. Thank God for small miracles. While he was in prison, Chris, of course, got the weird fan mail that all serial killers and well-known murderers get from people fawning over them and professing their love for them. But one woman reached out to Chris out of pure fascination. And according to Inside Edition, Chris responded to this woman. And she eventually started visiting with Chris when he was moved from a prison in Colorado to a prison in Wisconsin. The woman's name was Sherilyn Cadle. And she has letters from Chris, letters where he admits that he had not only been planning these murders for some time before they happened, but that he had also given Shanann Oxycontin once to try to cause her to have a miscarriage. Chris hoped that it would be easier to be with Kessinger if Shanann wasn't pregnant. This would explain why there was Oxycontin found during Shanann's autopsy. Chris even admits in these letters that he had tried to smother Bella and Cece in their beds earlier that night, but that they woke up. In the letter, he even says he's not sure how they woke up. So there's a lot more to this than what Chris still wants us to believe. And it was after a pregnant Shanann, Bella, and Cece's bodies were recovered when the case grew national attention that an attorney who had met Shanann by happenstance at a Japanese restaurant came forward. The kind of Japanese restaurant where they cook food in front of you and you just kind of have to sit with whoever fits the table. The kind of Japanese restaurant where you essentially eat dinner with strangers. But this attorney had ended up sitting with Shanann at the table, and Shanann offhandedly asked how messy divorces can get when they involve kids. This attorney basically just told Shanann that if she could fix her marriage, that that's what he would advise her to do, just because divorce gets pretty ugly most of the time, and especially with couples that have kids. And this conversation with a complete stranger happened in early 2018 when Shanann went out to dinner with a friend of hers. So things had to have at least been feeling off for her for some time. 
why else would she even bring this up to a complete stranger about divorce? And she even mentioned to this man who she'd never met before that Chris was the one that wanted to try for baby number three. Why would she mention that? Unless things were off. Shanann's dad, Frank, made a victim impact statement at Chris's sentencing. And Frank said, quote, You heartless monster. You have to live with this vision every day of your life, and I hope you see that every time you close your eyes at night. Prison is too good for you. May the courts have no mercy on you. You're an evil monster. And while Frank's reading this statement, Chris looks like he's trying really hard to get his tear ducts to work while his ex-father-in-law speaks directly to them. But Chris was never actually able to form a tear. And he looks like he's trying to look like he's feeling any kind of emotion at all, but he also failed at that. Chris's parents are still extremely close with their son, and Chris's mom, Cindy, is still adamant that Chris is lying about killing his entire family, you know, to protect Shanann. So maybe someone needs to run through the evidence with her one more time because she must not have been listening at the court hearings. And as far as Nicole Kessinger goes, according to Daily Mail, Kessinger submitted an application to change her name in Jefferson County, Colorado. She keeps a super low profile and nobody knows where she is or what's going on. And that's all I have on Chris Watts. I probably could have drugged this out for another two or three episodes, but I'm so sick of talking about Chris Watts that it's not even funny. I had a really hard time going into the little bit of detail that I did go into as far as how Shannon and the girls were killed, so I knew I wouldn't be able to go any deeper than that. But on that note, I do want to leave everybody with a question, and I'm going to need y'all to hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever, and let me know what you think the answer to this question is. Chris Watts killed his wife, who was 15 weeks pregnant. He killed his three-year-old daughter and his four-year-old daughter. This is a man who thought nothing of killing his wife, who was carrying their third child, and thought nothing of killing their two children that they already had. But he didn't kill the family dog, Dieter. Why? Riddle me that. So, I guess that's all for now. Let's do it again, same time, same place, next Wednesday. See you then. That's how my mama murdered a podcast.